go back over here. Elliot's here. Okay. Right, we are live on Facebook. We are live on Zoom, mm -hmm. and we are also on Twitter anytime. So thank you very much for everybody for joining me. Thank you for Twitter anytime for hosting this year. It's an amazing website. They keep on adding more and more content. It's, a, it's such a pleasure and such a privilege to be part of that platform. Please check it out, TorahAnytime.com if you get a chance. Okay, today we are up to Pasha Shemini. So we're on page 588 if you have an art scroll. Chumash, 588. And I'd like to share with you a few ideas that I saw today. Again, Vayikra, even though some people think Vayikra is boring, Vayikra has a tremendous amount to teach us and there's a tremendous amount of lessons to be had. And we're going to learn some of those lessons today. So let's start with the following. Rav Zalman Sarotskin says the following. We say that, the Bahi, we started with the Pasha. Bahi Bayam Hashmini was on the eighth day. Moshe calls to Aaron and his children and to the elders of Kaisal. And he says to Aaron, you need to take for yourself a calf as a chantos, as a sin offering, and a ram as an ola, as a burnt offering. And then to the Jewish people, he said, you need to take a goat as a sin offering. And on top of that, you also need to bring together an eagle and a kevah, so a sheep and another calf a burnt offering, and et cetera, et cetera, all these different offerings at the ring. Because today God is going to show himself to you. What does that mean today God is going to show himself to you? What was going to happen on that day that did not mean told them? So if we read later on in the Pasha, you will find that the Torah tells us after they brought all of the offerings, you look on page 590 in the Arts Book Chomish, Shlishi, so that's chapter 9, Parakhtes, Verse 24. A fire came out from a Kodesh and it ate, it consumed on the altar. The burnt offerings and all the different fats. All the people saw it, they were excited, they were extremely happy. And they fell on their faces. So we're, going to do that. we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. They fell on their face. So what does that mean? What is it? What happened over here in this instance of, so there was a special heavenly fire that came out from HaKadosh Baruch Hu and it consumed their offerings. And this was really, really important. And the reason for this is the following. And we read over here about the evolution of the emunah, of the belief that the Jewish people had in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So we start with the Jewish people being a slave nation in Mitzrayim. The Jewish people as a slave nation in Egypt, we read when we read about the Medrash about when the Jewish people made their way out of Egypt, when they were about to go and cross the Sea of Reeds, it says, <laughs> what the, <coughs> excuse me, what the angels said to God was, God, why in the world are you saving the Jewish people? The Jewish people are idol worshippers, and the Egyptians are idol worshippers. Why do one set of idol worshippers deserve to be saved, and the other set of idol worshippers we're going to kill? That doesn't make any sense. So that's what he says. So Jewish people were idol worshippers. Why did they worship the idols? We worship an idol. Part of the reason you worship an idol is because you're looking for something tangible, something real to be able to hold on to. It's very, very hard to believe in a God whom you cannot see. People say, Rabbi, can I see God? No. Can I hear God? No. Can I feel God? No. Can I smell God? No. Can I taste God? No. Those are all five senses. I can't do any of them. So how do I know he's real? Yeah. Many people ask the question, and if you were to speak to some atheists, they say to believe in God is like believing like there are uh, pink elephants running around. Pink invisible elephants. Can you see them? No, but they exist. Oh, all right. So, you know, if God exists, why aren't there pink invisible elephants for the same price? A lot of people, they feel that way. And they only would believe in something that they see. So the Jewish people as idol worshippers also believed in what they would see. So they saw 
They had an idol whom they could see, that they could smell, that they could hear, that they could perceive. And this was an important thing for them, an important thing for all idol worshippers to be able to somehow connect with a live being. The problem is that idols are not live beings. They might be beings, but they are statues. They're not real. There's nothing real about them. So whilst you have an idol, as you remember, we just a few days ago, we davened Hala. We said, Pelohem, they have a mouth, but they won't speak. Einayin they have eyes, they cannot see. Oznayin lohem, they have ears, but they cannot hear. Af lohem, a nose to them, they cannot smell. Yedehem, they have hands, and they cannot feel. We go through all five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. None of them. Whilst they have a mouth, whilst they have ears, they have a nose, they have eyes, they have hands, but those hands are not real. And if it's not real, guess what? It cannot do the function that your eyes do. So if we say, the idol has eyes, yes. Can a wooden statue, a golden statue, a bronze, a copper, a silver statue, can it see? No, can't see. Can it hear? Also not. Can it feel? Can it taste? Can it smell? None of those things. It can't do any of those things. Well, if it cannot do any of those things, what makes it real? What makes an idol real? And therefore, good evening, Michael. Therefore, you have the idols that the Jewish people served in Egypt, they realized that when they were dealing now suddenly with a real God, you're dealing with a Kodesh Baruch Hu, who is real, it's a very, very different prospect than dealing with an idol that cannot do anything. But then you have a problem. What's the issue? The Jewish people were not yet at the level to really stick to that. So we have the golden calf. What exactly happens with the golden calf? If you think about it, you have the golden calf, you have the Jewish people who are, who just left Egypt and they've made their way through the Sea of Reeds and now they made their way through Mount to Mount Sinai and God shows himself to them. And that Moshe Rabbeinu, and Moshe Rabbeinu is the conduit, the man that's going to go between them and this God that they cannot see and they cannot hear and they cannot perceive. And Moshe Rabbeinu dies, or so they're led to believe. The Satan, the dark ministering angel, allows the Jewish people to believe. He shows them a mirage. He shows them a vision of Moshe Rabbeinu having died. And now that Moshe Rabbeinu has died, it's a very scary prospect for the Jewish people. Who are they going to turn to now in order for them to be able to have some kind of connection, tangible connection to God. So guess what the Jewish people do? You take a people that's used to having a tangible thing that they can look towards, and what's the, what are they going to do? What's the next step that's the most obvious and logical thing that you expect the Jewish people to do? You know what the next step would be? And what the Jewish people actually end up doing? They create the golden calf, they create an idol, why? Because as a people that have just left Egypt, as a people that is used to having some kind of tangible thing that they can look towards, something they can see, something they can hear, something they can feel and perceive, they wanted to go back to that. They wanted to say, you know what? We're going to create for ourselves a statue, a graven image that allows us to perceive God fully. So what they did was they created the statue, the golden calf. And Moshe Rabbeinu suddenly comes down and Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, hey, what are you doing? And they realize the mistake that made and they get rid of the eagle. And now Kodesh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, after Moshe Rabbeinu has affected by Yom HaShem Salach Nikiparecha, God has forgiven the Jewish people. On Yom Kippur of that year, he forgave the Jewish people. And now Moshe Rabbeinu comes down and Kodesh Baruch Hu says, you know what? I realize now that for the Jewish people to live on a plane where they will not see, hear, feel, taste, or smell anything 
It's just outside the realm of what they are actually capable of doing. And so therefore what we need to do is we need to give the Jewish people something that they can feel, that they can perceive, that they can hear. And so our Kodesh Rogel says, I cannot allow them to make a graven image. Because so many times when you make an image, what ends up happening is there is a bit of a devolution. Not an evolution, but a devolution. You start with that thing being just a reminder that God is almighty. And this is just a reminder of the conduit to God. And slowly but surely you start thinking that these things themselves are gods. You start ascribing divine powers. You're going to call this thing a deity. And God says, no way am I going to allow them to make some kind of statue. Do you know what God says instead? They cannot perceive me as God. But you know what they can perceive? They can perceive my home. I will create a house. I will create a mishka. <coughs> Excuse me. A tabernacle and a sanctuary for those people to be able to come and to visit, for them to be able to actually see something with their own eyes. When you walked into the Mishkan, you saw the Mishkan, you felt the Mishkan, you smelt the Mishkan, you were able to eat the commandos and taste and, 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 and feel and hear everything. And for the Jewish people who were used to something tangible, this was God throwing them a bone, so to speak. God saying to them, look, I cannot allow you to have real images, this is as good as they're going to get. So I'm gonna give you a home. I'm gonna give you somewhere where you can focus all your energy, you can focus all your attention towards. And if you want to meet up, so to speak, in a physical sense with God, I'm going to give you a home. I'm going to give you a house that you can go to, a place that you can visit. And when you go to that house, and when you visit that place, you will feel my presence. And the Jewish people were overjoyed, and which is why they built the Mishkan, and which is why it was such a great, great celebration when they finally inaugurated the Mishkan. There was only one last thing that was missing. There was only one more problem, and that problem was something that they needed to solve, and that was the following. If you walked into the Mishkan, if you walked into that tabernacle, how did you know? Not how did you think. But how did you know? How were you able to perceive that it was God's house? Maybe Moshe Rabbeinu just built this big edifice. He built a place and he told a whole bunch of people, you're going to bring offerings and you're going to sing and you're going to be charged of this tax and you're going to be charged of that tax. And they built this crazy expensive building, this huge project that really has no validity towards it, no deity in it whatsoever. Do you know what happened then? The Jewish people on the day of the inauguration, they bring up their offerings, they bring whatever they did, and they look up to HaKadosh Baruch and say, okay, Hashem, we did it. You asked for this, we did it. You asked for all the gold and the silver and the copper and the different types of wood and the different oils and different diamonds. And we brought you everything and we built an exact replica of what you show Moshe Rabbeinu at Sinai. And we've now brought all the offerings that you asked us to bring. And we hope you accept all of that and we hope now to be able to connect back with you. And you know what God does? He sends down the fire to the altar and the fire consumes everything that the Jewish people had brought them on the altar. And suddenly the Jewish people, whilst they may not have seen God, because you cannot see, it's impossible to see God. God's not physical. It's not something that he can be perceived visually. But they now knew that God was in the Mishkan for them. They knew that that tabernacle that they had built would actually become God's sanctuary, would actually become the place where they can come and they can meet up with God. And that live, tangible revelation of the fire coming down was now enough for the Jewish people to know that God had forgiven them and that God now dwelt amongst them. And that's what I said, what the Apostle tells us. Today, God is going to appear to you. God is going to let you know and God is going to show you that he is with you. God is going to show you that he's in your temple, that he wants to have that connection with you, that he wants to have that relationship with you. And that is why he's going to bring down his heavenly fire so that you can feel that connection being part of what the Mishkan is and what God wanted from this Mishkan. That's the first idea that I wanted to bring
Now, two more ideas that I wanted to share with you. Two separate ideas, similar, I, I don't know if they're similar, but they're on the same theme. Oh, climb is here. They're on the same theme, and that's what I wanted to share with you now. If you go to page 592, we read a very interesting and a very disturbing passion. Vayikhuvne Aaron, the sons of Aaron took, Nodav and Abihu, the two sons, Nodav and Abihu took Ishmachto, so each man took their fire pan. Vayinuvo and Eish, they put in a fire, Vayasim on that guitar, so they put on the guitars. Vayakribu, and they brought as a korb, and if Nashem Eish saw before God, a strange fire, a fire that was an alien fire, Asher Loit Siva Oisam, that God had not commanded them to bring. They went on their own, they brought this. What happens to them? A fire comes out from God, and it consumed them by a Muslim Nashem, and they die before God. That's what happens to the sons of Nadav and Abihu. And it becomes that day that was supposed to be this great day of not only holiness, but this great day of rejoicing becomes a day of great Jewish tragedy because it becomes a tragedy that we face the fact that Nadav and Abihu had died. So, in the Medrash, one of the things that the Medrash says is that the important thing was that not of an Abihu, they needed to get rid of their Yetzirah. There was a Yetzirah that they had, and they didn't get rid of that Yetzirah. Because they didn't get rid of that Yetzirah, that is what led to their downfall and to their demise. And I want to discuss two different types of Yetzirahs. One which is discussed by Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, which we're going to come back to later, and one which is discussed by Rabbi Shimon Schwab and Isay from Ayam Beis So I'd like to start with the idea that Rabbi Shimon Schwab says, and it's a very, very important idea, an idea that is very much applicable <coughs> to all of us in our lives. And that's the following. Is there a limit to love? Does love need to have its limitations? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Just like any, just like any emotion in your life has to have its limitations, love must have its limitations. And a love that has no limitations whatsoever, a love that has no boundaries whatsoever, is a love that could lead to terrible things. So the example he starts with, they'll give a physical example, then we're gonna come back to this story of not of an Abu, and we're gonna see how it plays out in their lives, and then we can see how it can play out in our lives as well. So the practical example he says is, imagine if you had a woman who loved her child dearly, very, very dearly, in a most unbelievable way, and you watch this woman, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Sometimes you see it, you see parents that bend over to their children and they kiss their children and the kisses that they give are so hard that the kids start crying. I don't know if you've ever seen it. They take the kids and they take the cheek and I give this huge kiss and suddenly goes like Aah! That's an example of love gone slightly wrong. Because even though you love that child and you want to show that child the tremendous love that you have for him or her, by giving it that kiss, <coughs> by kissing it in a way that could potentially cause the child pain, could damage the child, that's not love. Because if you really love the child, you wouldn't kiss it in a way that's going to make it cry because that's a little bit too harsh. That's a little bit too strong. We wouldn't do that kind of thing. You know, sometimes you hear about this. I remember years ago, they used to speak about this, how dangerous it was. Having your children lying in your bed with you. Anybody remember this? If you have your children lying in bed with you and God forbid a hundred times over if a person turned over on their child, they could smother the child. They might not realize in their sleep that they were turning over onto their own child. And by the time they wake up, the child is no longer. And they think to themselves, all I wanted was for that child to feel my love. All I wanted is for that child. He wasn't able to sleep or she wasn't able to sleep in their bed. 
or in the cot, and we were sure that if we were to put them in the bed between my wife and between me, nothing's going to happen to him or her, and they're going to sleep so soundly, and they'll feel the warmth and the heat from both of us, and it's going to be such a wonderful thing, and, and, and that's great, that's lovely, that's wonderful, except for the fact that it caused a child's demise, that children have died because their parents have wanted to show them so much love that the love that they showed them ended up being lethal for them. Because by putting the child in the parent's bed and the parents then turning over onto the child, it has caused the children to die. So that's an example of love gone wrong. But that's a physical example of love gone wrong. There's also a spiritual example of love gone wrong. A spiritual example of love gone wrong is where a person says, I love this other person so much, I just feel a desperate need to give to them. When? Always, all the time, 24-7, etc., etc. Have you ever had somebody that seems to really like you so much that they're constantly calling you and they're constantly messaging you and they're constantly up your back and at one point another, you're like, stop. I need a bit of space also. You know, a lot of couples have struggled tremendously during this previous lockdown. And the reason they struggled so much during this lockdown was because suddenly they had to live together all the time. If you take a couple, so the husband goes out to work where he goes to work and the wife goes out to work where she goes to work. Well, if she stays home, she's a stay-at-home mom or she goes to work and he's a stay-at-home dad, whatever it is. But in most instances, you would find that spouses are not spending 24 hours a day with each other. They weren't constantly together with each other. And so there wasn't that time where they were getting on each other's nerves. But I heard last year from, especially from, from certain Rabbonim in, in the, in the Frommer community where you had people that had just gotten married that didn't know each other very well because they'd only been on a Shidduch. They'd gone out, what, five, six, seven times and they got engaged, they had a two, three month engagement. They got married and right after they got married, you got hit by the lockdown. And suddenly the husband is home, the wife is home, the wife who used to have a job in a school is home, the husband who was supposed to be going to call her, going to his job is also home. And you have this couple that don't know each other, that are stuck in together with each other 24 seven, every single day. Now it's hard enough for all of us who've been married for a long time to be able to do that. How much more so is this difficult for a young couple? You need a bit of space. All of us need a bit of space. I won't buy another, you know what? I need my own room. I need my own space. I just want to go out. I want to have, you know, and it's hard because it's overkill. It's too much. It is too much. That doesn't mean that, you know, the fact that we need some time away from our spouse at times doesn't mean we don't love our spouse. It's the other way around. Because we love our spouse, in order for us to have a loving relationship, we cannot 24-7 be hanging on to each other. Because if we do hang on to each other 24-7, guess what's going to end up happening? We're going to get sick and tired of each other. We're going to start driving each other bananas. His little things or her little idiosyncrasies are going to start driving each other crazy. They're going to start having arguments and fights where they normally never had these arguments. But being stuck together constantly does that. And therefore, a good relationship needs a bit of distance as well. Clive, are you going to say something? No, I'm okay. No. <laughs> Sorry, you just, you, just, uh, you just unmuted. That's the only reason I was asking. Oh, no, uh, it's, like, it's a bit like retirement. Yeah. When, when you retire, you know, it takes time to get used to spending so much time again with your spouse. With your spouse. It does. And for a lot of people, even in retirement, they take, on, or they take on certain things. You'll take on certain voluntary work or other things because, by the way, and it doesn't mean you don't love your spouse. It's just that as, as regular human beings, we're not wired to spend every waking moment with one individual. It's just not possible. It's too much. And then we start getting on each other's nerves. That doesn't mean we don't love each other. But the love over there is because it's too, in order to keep the love strong, it needs that distance. You can't constantly be 100% focused in again and again and again because it's too much. That's in a physical way. In a spiritual way, 
Aaron's children didn't see the boundaries that they were supposed to have. Their children, they were supposed to have boundaries. The boundaries mean that if God says, I want A, then A is what I want. And if God says, I don't want B, then don't bring B. But I love you so much. I want to buy you B anyway. Yeah. You ask your wife, you know, let's say you want a lottery and you have a lot of money. You say to your wife, you know what? I want to buy the most beautiful piece of jewelry and I'm going to go into town. And I'm now going to spend 500,000 pounds on this most ostentatious piece of jewelry ever just to show you my love for you. And she says, please do me a favor. Do not buy me that piece of jewelry. You can buy me something. I'm not saying don't buy me anything. I don't like it. It's ostentatious. It makes everybody stare at me. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes everybody else in the room uncomfortable. Buy me something a little bit more refined. And you go out and you say, no, but I love my wife so much. I'm going to buy the most expensive piece of jewelry in there. And you go into Mappin and Weber, you go into Beaver Brooks, whatever it is, and you say to them, what's the most expensive thing that you have? And they take out this awful piece of jewelry that you look at that's so ostentatious that your wife will never like, and you say, wow, 300,000 pounds, here you go. Swipe the credit card and you buy it and you bring it home and you say to your wife, I couldn't hold myself back. I love you so much. Here's the piece of jewelry that you loathe and that you hate that you don't want. That's love. I've not asked you to do that. I've asked you to listen. I've asked you to really focus and connect with me the way I want to connect with you. Not the way you want to connect with me because you love me so much. And Nodam and Abihu had this tremendous love for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But the love that they showed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu was without boundaries. And love without boundaries oftentimes ends up going in the wrong direction. Because we need boundaries. Within our love, we also need to have boundaries. And if we don't have those boundaries, you end up doing all sorts of things you're not supposed to do. So none of them have you. They take a fire that they're not supposed to. And they don't ask Moshe Rabbeinu or Aaron not going for advice. They just go and they do it. Why? I just feel I have to do it. But God doesn't want it. But I love him so much. Well, if you loved him so much, you'd listen. That's the wrong way of going about love. And that's what... Rev Schwab tells us over here that not even have you did wrong. They were too busy, too self-absorbed in their love for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to focus in on what they were really supposed to do. And he says, it's interesting, the Pasuk tells us, not the Pasuk, sorry, the Baruch Hu we say in the morning, we say, after after you say a you rock soil. And one of one of them you say is right? You want to keep away from the Yetzahara. So that's one thing. But on the other hand, lowly day hate, you shouldn't bring us to Khaid Abbam and that um the Khof as Israel they stabbed loch. After you say that you're getting rid of the Yetzirah, you then ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu and force our Yetzir to be Mishtabet Loch means that sort of almost be subjugated to you. So Rav Shalom says, what does that mean? You've already said beforehand that God should get rid of the Yetzirah. If God's gotten rid of the Yetzirah, why are we now saying force our Yetzir to be subjugated to you? I don't have a Yetzirah anymore. All I have left is a Yetzirah tov. Says Rav Shwab, exactly. You've gotten rid of the Yetzirah. You've gotten rid of the evil inclination. And now you only have the positive, the good inclination. But that good inclination also cannot be unbridled. That good inclination cannot be just left without any boundaries. Because if it's left without any boundaries, you end up doing the wrong thing. And therefore we say, the chofes yitzreinu leishtabedach. We pray that God is who take our positive. Take our Yetzirah Tov and force our Yetzirah Tov to do what you want it to do. Not just the Yetzirah. You need to learn to use your Yetzirah Tov correctly. And that's not so easy. Now he brings over there, he brings the following story. Very interesting story that he says. He says, Rav Chaim Balazhin. Rav Chaim Balazhin was the founder 
of the modern yeshiva movement in creating the yeshiva in Malajan. And Rav Chaim of Malajan was a Talmud, he was a student of the Gaon of Vilna. And he went to the Gaon of Vilna and he said to the Gaon of Vilna, Rebbe, I would like to build the yeshiva. And he was all excited and he said, that we're going to do this and we're going to do that. We're going to have this great, wonderful yeshiva. And the Gaon of Vilna was like, all right, want to, whatever. Very laissez fair about it. Very, very lackadaisical, as opposed to the enthusiasm that Rav Chaim Malosh had expected. He expected the God to say to him, what a wonderful idea. You go out and you create this yeshiva and you create students and you recreate what happened in Babylonia. None of that. He was a little bit dejected. He went away. He was still set, hopefully, on, on fulfilling his dreams. And a few years later, Rav Chaim Malosh bumps, bumps into the God. Well, the government says, Rechaim Malosh, and he says, no, so how's your yeshiva? He says, I don't know. I, mean, I still want to do it, but the Rebbe didn't give any brachas. He didn't give any blessings. So I didn't do it. He goes, so I'd like you to go and do it now. He says, why suddenly? You, at first you said, don't do it. Now he's saying, I should do it. Please decide. What do you want? He said, originally when you came to me, you were brimming so much with enthusiasm that I wasn't sure that that enthusiasm was coming from a right place are coming from the wrong place. Sometimes when you're so over-enthusiastic, it can tell me that it's coming from the wrong place. It's not something that's being done with seichel. It's something that's being done just through raw emotion and something that's being done with raw emotion without any thought, without any mind, without any seichel put to it, is worthless. Now that I see that I have dissuaded you from it and you still want to do it, you still want to get into that, even though, and I can see that you want to get into it because you think it's the right thing, not because of your crazy enthusiasm. And I can see it's something that you thought through properly. Now I'm behind it. Now go and open up Yeshiva. Now do what you're supposed to do. Because even the Yetzir HaTov, even our good inclination can mislead us sometimes if we don't know how to use it correctly. And that's what none of an Aviv did over here. Excuse me. They just didn't know how to use their good inclination properly. They didn't know how to be able to use it. And so therefore, the good inclination says, you have to give a present to God. And God says, I don't want that present. And their good inclination says, who cares? You love God so much, do it anyway. And that's where they went wrong. So that's how Rav Schwab learns it. That's one way of understanding it. Interestingly enough, and maybe... A little bit of a contrast, but the two things do go together also. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky says that if you look in Chazal, Chazal say there were a lot of other Averis that came up over here. That Aaron, that not even you died because they didn't ask Aaron and Moshe for advice. Or because they went in and they had drunk wine. Or their lot, or because they never got married. Lots of different things that Chazal say. And Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky asks the question, he says, I don't understand. The Torah tells us why they died. So why did Chazal go through a whole plethora of different kind of reasons why they died? If the Torah tells us, by Akriv Nashem, Azar, they brought before God a, an alien fire, which God had not commanded them. So that's the Amir that they did. So just stick with that. So Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky says, Chazal were bothered by something else. And this is what Rav, uh, Rav Shimon Shmuel was speaking about also. How does such a thing happen? How do you end up with two people as great as not even Abiyu doing something that they shouldn't have done? And therefore, Chazal said there was something else here. On the one hand, yes, there was this unbelievable love. But part of that unbelievable love, even though Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky doesn't tie the two of them together, sometimes love that is so overwhelming that doesn't even listen to the other side, that doesn't take the other side into consideration, is not love, it's infatuation. And it comes from an overinflated value of yourself. When you think of yourself too highly, when you think too much of yourself, when there's a certain amount of gaiva that comes in there, then you feel like, you know, I love God so much, I have to do whatever I think is right. But more than that, how do you have Moshe and Aaron, the two greatest Jews living in that generation, perhaps the two greatest Jews ever, there in the Mesa Mikdash, and you have this wonderful idea. You say, you know what? I'm going to bring my own fire. Great. 
Go ask Moshe if that's a good idea. Go ask Aaron if God agrees with that. No, no, I'm not going to ask Moshe. I'm not going to ask Aaron. I'm just going to act on my own. How do you act on your own without asking Moshe Rabbeinu? It's not like a little rabbi. Moshe Rabbeinu, the rabbi of all of Kaisal, the man that brought the Torah down from heaven all the way to us as a Jewish people. You just decided to do something like that, something so OTT, something so out of the ordinary without speaking, without consulting Moshe Rabbeinu first, if this was a good idea, you just go ahead and you do it? How could you do such a thing? Says Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, we can see over here from the fact that they didn't ask for advice, that there was something wrong. There was some form of arrogance, a gasus ruach that went on inside them. And that arrogance leads then to all the other Amirs. I can't get married because nobody's good enough for me. But nobody's good enough for you. Says, well, look, our uncle is Moshe Rabbeinu. Our father is Aaron. We serve in the base of Mikdash. We're such great time in Well, nobody's good enough for you. Moshe Rabbeinu can find a wife. Aaron can find a wife. All of you don't find a wife, you can't find a wife. How come? The answer is, if you think too much of yourself, then nobody's good enough for you. And you bring the fire because you didn't ask and you don't ask Moshe Rabbeinu because you think you're big enough. All these things happen because you have an overinflated sense of self. And therefore, and that even connects a little bit with the, uh, with the idea that Rav Schwab said also, because this great love also sometimes comes from an overinflated sense of self. I have to give to you. Yeah, but I don't want what you're giving me, but I have to give it anyway, because this is how I see things. That's got nothing to do with me. Why would you do that? Why would you give to somebody something that they don't want to get from you? Just because you feel you have to give it anyway. That's not called giving. That's not called being there for another person. That's being self-absorbed and therefore you give to somebody else. And so we see over on the one hand a great love and we can see how this love can be used incorrectly. And on the other hand, we also see on the, the other side of this coin is self-absorption. And both of those things you need to be very, very careful of. Not to be too self-absorbed in yourself. And that leads to not listening when other people say they don't want certain things. They don't want certain advances. They don't want certain show of love, whatever it might be to learn to work with other people. A real relationship is, even though you love your wife more than you love someone else, anybody else, you love your husband more than you love anybody else, but it's within the confines of what's correct within a relationship, within the confines of what the other person wants as well. And not just that you yourself decide, this is how I want to show my love, regardless of what the other side says, this is how I'll show my love and she'll have to just accept the way I show love to her anyway. Because that's not really love. That's infatuation and that's being self-absorbed. Mm. If you take these lessons, so you see what none of you do is not only something that they did, but it's something that many of us do in our lives also. And we need to learn, instead of focusing on ourselves when we want to love other people, focus on the other person and show the love to the other person the way the other person would like to have it shown to them and the way the other person deserves to have it shown to them. And then that's true love. Okay, yeah, five. That was very, what about the extreme level of punishment that Hashem um, did, did for them? Because, you know, it, that was so, so enormous a piece of punishment for, for, for one mistake. Uh, okay, it, so that's, that's a very, very good question. I think we have spoken about this in this year before, why the level of punishment was so great. But many times, I mean, some of the things to, to mention are, number one, that the, if you look in Chazal, because I'll tell us that they did something wrong already by the time of the ego. By the time, not, I'm sorry, not by the time of the ego. By the time of the giving of the Torah, we see that there were people that they perceived God, they ate, they drank, they were, there were things that went wrong already earlier on, but God didn't want to punish them. And now they did a second Avera, and it was these two Averas together that caused their sin. That's one way of understanding it. The other way of understanding the great sin of Nadam and Avihu is the greater a person is, the harder they fall. You know, you can have somebody very far down the chain. I'm sure you know, you'll, you'll know this from, uh, from your job when you were in charge of the, of the pharmaceuticals in the Northwest. So if you've been a regular chemist in a regular chemist shop, 
and you made a mistake. So as long as the mistake wasn't massive, they'd be like, all right, look, every chemist makes a mistake. But when you're in charge of the entire Northwest and you make the same mistake that the guy on the bottom of the totem pole makes, heads roll very quickly. On the top of the totem pole, heads roll very, very quickly. You know, when, when an MP does something, he, he'll have to give, you know, sometimes there's certain MPs that have said things, they have to give up on it just because they said something. The lady who was running against Theresa May said that Theresa May wouldn't make a great prime minister because she never had any children. And because of that comment, she had to give up her entire, her entire chance of becoming prime minister. Now, if a woman, if you had asked somebody in the street and they had said the same thing, I don't know if Theresa May would make a great prime minister. She never had children. What does she know about having kids? And you know, what does she know about families, et cetera, et cetera? Nobody would say anything. Because you were so far up, the higher up the chain you are, the less it takes to make you roll all the way down to the bottom. And so therefore, that's the other understanding. So it's either accumulation of more than one Avera or the fact that not an Avera were so great, the greater they are, the greater also the punishment that they get if they do even a sin which smaller people would never receive the same punishment for. Okay, so thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I wish you all a, a good night. Look forward to seeing you, Mitzvah Hashem, next week. Thank you to those who joined us on Facebook, on Zoom, and on Twitter anytime.